Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, with that, we'll hand things over to Sellers Dorsey. Great. Thank you so much, Patrick. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sellers Dorsey and the team here are happy to be here with you today as we discuss preparing for the end of the public health emergency. Um, the agenda for today uh, includes a background and federal updates, which my colleague Lisa will be walking us through. We'll have a state update from Janice and then some specific state initiatives and information from Jill Hayden. Uh, then we'll be uh, moving on to a panel that I'll be moderating with a series of questions that we've received in advance, and then audience Q&A. But before we get started, uh, we're actually going to start with a small poll. Um, so I think Patrick will be pulling that up. So how many folks attending the call today are not at all worried about the ending of the PHE? We're gonna give it about 60 seconds for everyone to respond. Don't be shy. There we go. Okay. Well, um, we are not surprised to see these results, which is why we're all here today. Uh, so thank you so much for weighing in. Um, it certainly has been weighing on all of our minds. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Allen, who is going to be walking us through the background and federal update. Thanks, Karen. If you could advance to slide three. I'm sure <clears throat> trying. It is not advancing. Let's see. Patrick, any suggestions here? Yeah, I'd say just uh, stop sharing and just reload it. Okay. And just try it again. That'll probably fix it. Technology, <laughs> wonderful when it works. So right. just based off of, I, I will go ahead and get started. And if we could move to slide three, if you're able to do that, Karen. No, it's not working. Okay. Not sure why. If you'd like, I can go ahead and share the slides. That'd be great. Um, it worked in our trial. There we go. All right, if we can move to the next slide. So as we get started, we'd like to give a bit of background and context for why the unwinding of the public health emergency is such an important topic for CMS, state Medicaid programs, Medicaid members, MCOs and other business partners across the Medicaid program. And just from the poll that, that we just took, it looks like 87% of you have some concerns about the unwinding of the public health emergency. So <clears throat> just to move into some of the background, the COVID-19 public health emergency declaration was initially issued by the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services on January 31st of 2020. Since that time, the public health emergency declaration has been extended every 90 days, including most recently on April 15th of 2022. <clears throat> With this latest extension, the public health emergency declaration is now extended until July 15th of 2022. However, the secretary may end it sooner. The public health emergency declaration provides states and the federal government with additional flexibilities, including waivers of eligibility policies, services, and payment methods and standards in order to maintain healthcare coverage and access during the emergency. So as such, states and their MCO partners have pressed for significant lead time to prepare for the eventual unwinding of the COVID-19 PHE. The Biden administration has also committed to provide states with 60 days advance notice of the public health emergency end date. Also, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act was passed by Congress at the beginning of the public health emergency, and it required states to keep Medicaid beneficiaries enrolled as of March 18, 2019, for the duration of the public health emergency as a condition of receiving a 6.2% increase in federal matching funds. Since the first public health emergency declaration, 
CMS's most recent enrollment reports from November identified that Medicaid and CHIP have seen an increase of 15 million enrollees. This is a 21.4% increase with now more than 85 million individuals receiving coverage through these programs. This is significant. While these are two separate federal actions, they are inextricably linked and have heightened the awareness and need for additional federal support and flexibility as states prepare to return to what their new normal operations might look like. One of the most significant actions states are preparing for is resuming their Medicaid and CHIP eligibility redeterminations. CMS has worked with states to understand that their current challenges, what actions states have taken during the public health emergency, what additional supports and flexibilities are needed. As such, on March 3rd of this year, CMS re released a state health official letter entitled Promoting Continuity of Coverage and Distributing Eligibility and Enrollment Workload in Medicaid, CHIP, and the Basic Health Program upon conclusion of the COVID-19 public health emergency. Note that this guidance document is focused on promoting continuity and coverage um, for enrollees. The letter provides CMS guidance for states to begin planning for Medicaid eligibility redeterminations, including the role that MCOs and other providers and community partners could play in assisting states with their planning and execution of redeterminations, all in order to facilitate an orderly process to minimize the burden for beneficiaries and also promote continuity of coverage for members. Likewise, on March 21st, CMS released two reporting templates to assist CMS in providing oversight, as well as to provide technical assistance to states as they develop and begin their return to eligibility renewals. And on April 4th, CMS also provided states with additional guidance on fair hearing processes and approaches, as well as best and promising practices for PHE unwinding efforts. Several of these approaches highlighted how states and MCO partners can work together to outreach to beneficiaries and increase awareness of the upcoming redetermination process. For instance, Kansas and Tennessee were highlighted for social media campaigns that showed promising results for increased beneficiary engagement. We will also be highlighting some of this additional state activity. Karen, if you could move to slide four. The most recent state health, of health official letter provided states with additional time to complete their eligibility redeterminations post the PHE declaration. States will now have 14 months to complete renewals, post enrollment verifications and eligibility redeterminations while remaining compliant with the 12 month unwinding period. This guidance addressed states concerns over the 12 month deadline outlined in previous CMS guidance and provide states with an additional two months to initiate processes prior to acting on specific cases. This allows states to preserve the increased 6.2% federal matching funds during this initiation period, providing states with continued financial support to ramp up their outreach and activities for unwinding. States, however, must maintain continuous enrollment of Medicaid and CHIP beneficiaries through the last day of the month in which the PHE ends to be eligible to claim the additional 6.2% federal matching for the entire quarter in which the PHE termination month falls. So for example, if the PHE ends on July 15th, as it's currently set pending additional extension by the HHS secretary, states may not act to terminate coverage for beneficiaries until August 1st. This will enable the state to continue to receive that additional 6.2% federal matching funds through the end of the quarter in which the PHE ends. In this example, that would be through September 30th of 2022. If a state would elect to end the continuous enrollment condition and complete eligibility renewals and redeterminations prior to the first day of the month after which the PHE ends, they would no longer qualify for that 6.2% federal matching fund enhancement. 
Slide five, please. The March 3rd CMS state health official letter also requires states to develop operational unwinding plans to address pending applications, verifications of eligibility, changes in beneficiary circumstances, and renewals accumulated during the public health emergency. According to CMS, nearly all states reported conducting some renewals during the public health emergency, even though they haven't really acted on them. The latest guidance also requires states to determine their approach to unwinding. CMS guidance offered several approaches, including a population-based approach, a time-based approach, or a hybrid approach. Based on recent information from the Kaiser Family Foundation, 11 states have indicated that they would be taking a population-based approach, eight states indicated taking a time-based approach, and the remainder seem undecided. States will need to evaluate which approach meets their individual circumstances and assess the long-term impact of the approach on their el ongoing eligibility processes and operations. Based on the more recent information from the Kaiser Family Foundation, just over half of states, 27, have determined their approach. For MCOs, you will want to understand what approach your state intends to take. In addition, CMS has noted that a majority of states, uh, for, I believe it's 41, plan to spread renewals over the full 12 months of the unwinding period. But how the state uses the additional two months uh, uh, to get to the 14 months will need to be included in the state's unwinding report. Legislative and budgetary factors will likely play a, a role in states' decisions about timing and prioritization of cases. All timing options present policy trade-offs for states. A later start to the unwind period may mean a loss of the enhanced 6.2% federal funding before member transitions or, or terminations. And an earlier start to unwinding may mean earlier member coverage loss and higher numbers of uninsured individuals. These are all considerations that states are weighing at this point. On March 21st, CMS also released resources to assist states with the required reporting tied to the termination of the PHE. The first is the state report on plans for prioritizing and distributing renewals following the end of the Medicaid continuous enrollment provisions or the distribution report. This report will set forth the state's renewal distribution plan, including the number of Medicaid and CHIP renewals the state intends to initiate each month during the unwinding period. The report will also provide the state's plan to prioritize and distribute the work over the course of the 12 month unwinding period with the focus again on ensuring that eligible individuals remain enrolled or are transferred to the appropriate healthcare coverage program during that unwinding period. Examples of the types of strategies that CMS is expecting to see in these states report, reports include if the state is strengthening their renewal processes, like making IT systems changes or adding additional staff, activities and processes that the state is taking to update mailing addresses, including partnerships with MCOs and other organizations enlisted to support that activity, improving enrollee outreach, communications, and assistance, and how the state is promoting seamless coverage transitions and ensuring the fair hearing process is timely and accessible. States will only be required to submit this report once to CMS, and it will be due within 45 days before the end of the month in which the PHE ends. So if CMS notifies states 60 days in advance of the end of the PAG, this will only give states 15 days to submit this report to CMS. So it is very likely that states have been working very diligently over the course of the last several months to determine what their steps will be in their process. CMS has indicated that it will communicate the specific date that this form is due when it provides the 60 days advance notice of the end of the PAG. 
Slide six, please. The second resource released with the March 21st first letter is the Unwinding Eligibility and Enrollment Data Report Excel Workbook and Specifications Document. This report includes metrics designed to demonstrate a state's progress towards restoring timely application processing and initiating and completing renewals of eligibility for all Medicaid and CHIP enrollees and timely processing of fair hearings. This report is meant to serve as a starting point to track a state's pending eligibility and enrollment actions as they begin their unwinding. CMS has indicated in their guidance document that states should not process more than one ninth of their caseload in any month. This report will be a way for CMS to actually track how states are adhering to this guideline. States will also be required to report monthly data on pending and completed applications and renewals and pending fair hearings. States must report this data in a baseline submission before the end of the PAG and on a monthly basis thereafter. So baseline reports will be due at the end of the month prior to the month in which the state's unwinding period begins. Um, CMS has also indicated that monthly reports will be due on the eighth calendar day of each month with the first monthly report due on the eighth of the month following the month in which the state begins its unwinding period. CMS did hold an all state webinar on April 12th to provide states with information on the metrics and report submission requirements. The materials from that call have not yet been posted on the CMS website, but should be there shortly. So even with effective planning, many Medicaid and CHIP beneficiaries may lose coverage. This could be more prominent in those states that have not yet expanded Medicaid. This can may cause changes in case mix for MCOs and other providers, and also lead to decreased per member per month capitation payments. CMS has also clarified that there are no federal regulatory barriers that prevent states and MCOs from working together to help individuals who are terminated from Medicaid or CHIP coverage with assisting the transition to other sources of coverage. For instance, CMS encourages states to work with Medicaid managed care plans that also offer a qualified health plan to share information with enrollees who are determined ineligible for Medicaid to assist in the transfer of individuals to the marketplace for coverage. With that background and overview of some of the more recent federal guidance, I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Janice Fagan, who will discuss more specific details about state approaches and their work with MCO partners. And I see that there are lots of questions coming in through, through um, the question function and chat. So we'll be happy to answer some of those at the end of our session. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, under this section, we're really talking about two things. We're talking about state-specific Medicaid agencies and how they're going to be implementing the federal guidance that Lisa just walked us through. But we're also gonna be talking about the entire sort of state ecosystem because within each of these states, um, we have managed care companies, we have the vendors that serve those managed care companies, and we have a variety of community and provider stakeholders. Um, so I'm gonna be tag teaming in this section with my colleague, Jill. Um, we've selected two particular states uh, to share with you that are near and dear to our hearts, um, Texas and Illinois, and just showing um, a couple of approaches that these uh, two states have decided to, uh, to take. Um, yeah, and I see many, many questions as well, Lisa. So um, why don't we go to the next slide, please? Um, so this is um, going to be some, um, some repetition of what you've already heard um, and, and also uh, some additional emphasis. So one thing that there's been perhaps some misunderstanding about is that states have been doing no redetermination work during uh, the COVID years, we'll call them. Um, but in actuality, over half of states have reported 
uh, the attempt to process renewals. Of course, they were not allowed to disenroll anyone, but they have been continuing some type of redetermination activity. And then one in five states reported using a methodology called ex parte renewals. Um, and this process uh, basically uh, depends on interrogating data sources before reaching out to um, a Medicaid eligible individual to uh, renew their coverage. So one in five states were using the ex parte uh, process again during the COVID years and will um, most likely continue to do that. As um, Lisa said, uh, just over half of the states, 27 states, reported that they have determined their approach. And I did note a, a question about, uh, do we have the names of those states? Um, and we'll get to that when we get to the questions. Um, a majority of states do plan to spread renewal over the full 12 months. However, not all of them do. Seven states plan to resume normal operations more quickly. So in choosing the two states that we're gonna feature here today, we have one example of each of those. One state that will uh, spread it over the 12 months and um, one state that won't. And as I said, we're doing Texas and Illinois. So I'll let you guess in advance uh, which uh, bucket they fall into. Um, Many states have already initiated their communication strategy. Um, 41 states have indicated that they will be following up with enrollees when there is a threat or jeopardy um, of loss of coverage to try to avoid that. And um, in preparation for the end of the public health emergency, states are using the time leading up to that to try to um, first and foremost update mailing addresses, as well as other critical information that would be needed in the redetermination process. And yes, you did hear me say mailing addresses as in snail mail. Um, and I'm going to talk more about this in a couple of slides, but the predominant method for communication is going to be the US Postal Service. Um, many states have indicated a concern about workforce issues. Um, 30 states have indicated that they will have to take some type of action to boost their capacity, whether that's um, engaging with vendors to assist them in this process, or actually hiring people, um, or a hybrid approach, a combination of both of those. And then in 20 states that uh, reported to CMS, the average estimate is about 13% of Medicaid enrollees uh, will be disenrolled. Uh, of course, we've seen much higher numbers than that uh, from some other individual states, and you may be hearing that information in the states uh, that you work in. Okay, next slide, please. So the first state approach that we're going to talk about is Texas. And um, I believe, and Lisa Allen will correct me if I'm wrong, that this would be an example of a population approach. And I believe that was one of the questions. Um, we chose Texas for a couple of reasons. One is they were early, relatively early um, in releasing um, in writing a, an approach and have been sharing this approach very broadly throughout the Texas ecosystem. Um, so the, the way that they have segmented the population in Texas, and they have some big numbers to deal with. You know, we're talking about a state that currently has uh, over 5 million people on the Medicaid rolls. So they segmented their population for redetermination. They called them cohorts. So the first cohort are individuals that they believe are most likely to be ineligible to continue on Medicaid or would be eligible to transition to CHIP. 
um, or other programs for that matter. In Texas, for example, uh, pregnant women who have uh, exhausted their postpartum period, uh, which is currently two months, um, can transition to a non-Medicaid program, which is called the, the Healthy Texas uh, Women's Program. Um, and then, of course, there are other populations that are listed here who are likely to be ineligible for um, sort of clear reasons. They've aged out or the adult recipient no longer has an eligible dependent in their household. So this particular cohort as of the end of 2021 is predicted to be about 880,000 clients. Now those numbers uh, may be updated uh, before the end of the PHE. Um, so th that number may fluctuate one way or the other, but that's kind of the, that's the first cohort. The second cohort are individuals or includes individuals who will likely transition to a different Medicaid eligibility group. Now, Lisa uh, mentioned, um, you know, there's a concern uh, for states that have not expanded Medicaid. And so Texas uh, is also an example of a state that has not expanded Medicaid to uh, the child, childless adult population. Um, so when we talk about individuals transitioning, the reasons for that transition are listed here. Um, and that's the smallest cohort, approximately 280,000 member clients in this second cohort. Um, the third cohort is the biggest. And the third cohort includes everyone, not previously included, um, and includes those most likely to remain eligible. So children in Medicaid, as long as they are below uh, their 21st birthday um, would be an example of that. And this is 1.8 uh, million potential clients that have to be redetermined. So in terms of the timing, Texas is an example of a state that wants to do it faster. Um, and they have elected to um, do it over a nine month period. And that means that their process will be complete by February 1st, uh, 2023, if this approach is successful. And so the um, timing of the disenrollments, according to the different cohorts are, are listed on this slide. And, um, uh, letters informing members about the end of the public health emergency and the process of redetermination or eligibility checking will begin in June of 2022. And Lisa also um, mentioned the critical date of August 1st. Um, so disenrollments for the first cohort would begin effective August 1st. Um, thus protecting the FMAP um, contribution for the Texas um, Medicaid program. And then you can see the different timing and how it all leads up to um, the culmination on February 1st, 2023. So if we would go to the next slide, um, just a little bit more about uh, the other stakeholders in Texas and what managed care organizations are doing. Um, all of the managed care organizations in Texas, there are about 20 of them, including uh, the dental plans, have all committed to do everything they can to help the state. And this has really been an all hands on deck kind of uh, approach. Um, so the state wants to drive as many people as possible to the uh, mobile app called Your Texas Benefits. and encourage people to do that updating that we were uh, talking about of their addresses and other demographic and financial information in that, in that account. They can do that on their phone or they could do it on a computer. Um, they're also asking managed care organizations besides reminding people about, uh, not just reminding, but actually helping them download the app, um, reminding them that they may be getting um, uh, renewal packets in the mail and that they should pay attention to those letters. Um, I know we all know there's a lot of issues with mailing addresses, but there's also an issue where people get this information and they don't 
um, open it or read it or think that they need to respond to it. So really urging them to pay close attention. Another thing that we're seeing is where managed care organizations are applying to participate as community enroller programs. This has in the past been the domain of um, community-based organizations, but managed care um, companies are stepping up and saying, uh, to the extent that we're allowed to do this and in compliance with all of the marketing rules, we want to help um, get the word out and help people navigate through the redetermination process. So a moment ago, I, I mentioned snail mail and, and that um, a, a lot of states are, are, de are depending on, on the mail for this process. And I just wanted to provide a little bit more context on this. Um, the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, reported in March that, and I think this has been widely published um, on all of the news services that just about 11 states said that they would actually be using um, texting to alert uh, Medicaid recipients about the impending end of the public health emergency. Um, and, and in contrast, 33 states plan to use snail mail, um, as well as probably uh, combined with some type of um, automated phone calls or even live phone calls. Um, and you know, it, it, it's, um, it's a challenge for states that didn't already have a, a texting platform in place to get something like this up and running uh, quickly. And um, it's also a challenge for managed care companies if, if they have not been doing this uh, prior um, in an automated way um, because member consent is required. So um, in the case of states, they would not have had to have that consent, but in the case of managed care companies, they will. And so that's why we believe there's, you know, there will be use of text. And I think that's where managed care companies can really, really help out, um, but not so much uh, uh, being initiated by the states themselves. Next slide, please. So one last um, expression of the whole ecosystem are all the other stakeholders and every state has these stakeholders. Um, we talked about managed care organizations and of course there are the local health plan associations. Every managed care company is a member of one of these and we also have physician associations um, and, and then community-based organizations. And again, it's all hands on deck Every association has offered uh, to help in any way that they can to get the message out um, and um, are, are providing suggestions, um, welcome and maybe not so welcome to the state Medicaid agency. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jill, who is gonna take you through another state example, Illinois. Thanks, Janice. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about Illinois specifically and what's happening here. Um, I will say that Illinois, which has about 85% uh, Medicaid members enrolled in managed care, has done a good job of communicating with stakeholders, including MCOs on this issue. Um, and ironically, the reason for that is that for years, the state has had quite a large backlog of Medicaid eligibility and renewal applications on hand. Um, in fact, it was one of the first initiatives uh, tackled by the current director when she took office. And so as a result of that, the state Medicaid agency has um, been giving regular updates to its Medicaid advisory committee and members of the public on the status of that backlog. And so when COVID hit, the state simply just adjusted its updates on the status as they continued to process those applications on hand and prepared for the end of the public health emergency at the same time. Um, while the state did not mail out applications during the public health emergency, um, in addition to working through that backlog, they did process as many ex parte renewals as possible using electronic verification sources. Um, so we're up to about 30 to 40% now that are done through ex parte, and there's efforts to increase that number um, as much as possible. Um, for the remainder of the renewals, um, Illinois does plan to take the full 12 months. Uh, dividing it up into monthly allocations based on expiration dates, um, but obviously, you know, meeting those one ninth um, thresholds as well set by CMS. 
Um, but recognizing that Medicaid members have not had to complete these forms in over two years, and some never before at all, and the fact that addresses have changed, um, Illinois is also taking an all hands on deck approach to outreach to ensure that everyone is aware of what's coming, the steps to prepare, and to ensure that no one who remains eligible is removed from the Medicaid rolls. Next slide. So as you can see on this screen, um, Illinois has uh, issued a branded outreach campaign um, that any and all willing stakeholders can use um, to get the word out that renewals are coming. Um, this includes, as you can see there, text, call scripts, website, emails, flyers, um, and even PSAs. Um, the messaging has been translated into several different languages. And it's been standardized so that all stakeholders are using the same message, including the MCOs, uh, who normally have to have any member facing materials reviewed and approved by the department, which can take a while. Next slide. Um, so you can see here this branded campaign is really a four step approach. Um, phase one is the phase that we're in now, really getting the word out as much as possible to update those addresses. Um, you can do that through what we call either Manage My Case, which is a web-based platform, or they've also established a 1-800 number where you can call in and change that in real time. Um, phase two is going to be preparing for the change once we actually have the date of the end of the PHE. Um, again, just getting the word out that it's coming and be on the lookout for those materials. And then phase three is going to be honing in on the populations whose uh, expir expiration dates are actually coming up fairly quickly and trying to target um, messaging to them as well. And then phase four is going to be transitioning those found to be ineligible for Medicaid uh, over to the exchange as much as possible to ensure that they continue to, to get covered. Um, and then lastly, I would just note that while attention is obviously placed on these efforts as a result of the PHE, um, the MCOs in Illinois have been providing their PCPs with renewal dates for a few years now um, to help with application efforts. Um, they've had some success with that, but I think that they're hoping that this campaign will highlight the importance of this process going forward um, to engage more providers in these efforts to help ensure that continuity of coverage. So that's what's happening in Illinois. Um, and I am gonna hand it back over to Kieran, who I think is gonna do another poll. Yes, Patrick, we have another poll for our group. Is your plan um, assisting your state uh, with outreach related to the end of the PHE? So are you all working with your states um, to assist with the end of the PHE? You heard a lot of valuable information today on how two of our states are handling the wind down. Okay, responses have slowed down. Anyone else want to vote? We'll go ahead and close it out. Okay. So let's see, 38% say yes, 11% said no, and about 51% didn't answer, which may reflect that we're not sure. Uh, so again, uh, it's been a very collaborative approach in the two states that you heard of today, and I would encourage all of you to um, solicit that feedback from your state contracting partners. So we're going to move on now um, to uh, some questions for our panel. I have some pre-selected questions uh, that we'll be walking through and then we'll open it up to the Q&A. I see we've got about 14 here, some of which may have already been answered in the presentations. Uh, the first question, if you could change the slide, please, um, is what is the impact of redetermination on um, members? Uh, so Lisa, I know you talked a lot about how CMS is trying to help with that. Yes, and, and I think this is one of the key factors in, um, in the CMS guidance is maintaining coverage, uh, healthcare coverage for members who are currently uh, receiving that coverage. Um, for members, Medicaid is a lifeline uh, in many instances, and especially for those uh, who are some of the most vulnerable. So I would say those individuals who are receiving long-term services and supports 
as well as individuals who um, have significant disabilities, helping them understand exactly what, what is needed. There, there generally is more information that is required from those individuals um, as they process eligibility applications um, for, for those members. Um, so it, you know, some of these services are lifelines to enable individuals to remain in their homes, to stay in their communities with loved ones, et cetera. So making sure that, that they understand what is happening and using all resources um, that support those individuals, whether it be service coordinators or care managers, MCO outreach, um, you know, primary care member outreach is, is significant to make sure that they're, they're doing what's necessary in order to maintain that coverage. And then, you know, a significant number of children also um, receive coverage through Medicaid. It's, it's one of the larger groups of, of individuals. And just making sure that they understand what the options are that are available um, in terms of potentially CHIP eligibility, um, as well as marketplace coverage for those folks. Um, so I think, you know, just in general, you know, impact for members, especially those that MCOs are working with through their complex care management programs, their disease management programs, you know, Medicaid is, is really a support and a lifeline for those individuals to maintain the necessary coverage and supports that they need um, to stay and maintain healthy in their communities, et cetera. So I would say, you know, this is, this is a key. Um, in, in making sure that we have health coverage for as many folks as possible. Lisa, thank you. Um, with over 70% of Medicaid recipients receiving their Medicaid benefits through some aspect of managed care, clearly the managed care organizations and the attendance today uh, reflect um, significant impact to the MCOs. Uh, Janice, we heard um, in some of your comments regarding impact on capitation rates, obviously enrollment. What are some of the things that you're hearing in terms of impact to managed care organizations? Um, thanks. Um, yeah, the, the last couple of years, uh, plans have had uh, larger enrollment, right? Because uh, the states were not allowed to disenroll folks. But in many ways, it's kind of the same problem that we had before COVID, which is the churn. And ensuring that people have continuity of care um, and that um, what we don't want, what nobody wants is for people to lose coverage because of a lack of awareness that they needed to submit information. Um, and, you know, and then six months later, you see that that individual is back on your plan. So, I think the kind of age old avoidance of churn um, is a big issue. And um, in a state like Texas, where you don't have the exchange um, to refer to, how do you help those members who truly are now ineligible and ensuring that they get to the right community based organizations? And, you know, the old uh, analogy of the balloon, <clears throat> we're squeezing the balloon on one end and you know, these, this large number of, of folks are gonna need services. They're gonna be squeezing the resources of community-based organizations. Wow, oh, for sure. Uh, Jill, I know you work very closely with provider associations in Illinois and several provider organizations. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're hearing in terms of the impact and how they can help. Yeah, um, so the one thing that Medicaid providers and trade associations always worry about is obviously the budget. Um, you know, many states are in the process of finalizing their state budgets this spring, and they're having to consider, you know, what the impact of that 6.2% FMAP decrease will have on their revenues and when. Um, but at the same time, you know, while renewals may cause some of the enrollments to go down, the demand for services are still going to be there, um, especially in areas of, you know, routine primary and preventive care, other services that may have been delayed during the pandemic, um, and especially in the area of behavioral health. You know, we've seen an increased demand for both mental health and, and substance use services coming out of the pandemic. Um, there's also, you know, outstanding questions in, in states around certain flexibilities like telehealth. Is that going to continue after the public health emergency? Um, here in Illinois, it's basically left up to the department to decide what they're going to keep and what's going to go. So there's going to be a lot of discussion around telehealth. 
Um, and this, of course, is all compounded by the fact that we still have staffing shortages in all healthcare sectors, including hospitals and nursing homes and home and community-based services. Um, and obviously, at the end of the PHE, a lot of that federal help that we've been seeing to really bolster providers and Medicaid programs is going to be going away. So, you know, ultimately, this just means, um, you know, it's going to have an impact on capacity for providers. It's going to impact access to care and their bottom line. And it's also going to have the impact of putting more pressure on our safety nets, like our FQHDs, who are going to do the best that they can, obviously, to meet that demand, but are also going to be facing, um, you know, capacity issues as well. So, um, you know, a lot to consider there from a provider perspective, um, which obviously has a trickle down effect on, on access to care for members. And then, you know, for the MCOs considering, you know, accessing that full service array for, for their members as well. It, uh, it doesn't uh, seem that there's any aspect of uh, any stakeholder involved in, in Medicaid today that isn't going to be touched by, by the unwinding of the, of the public health emergency. And oftentimes, um, you know, we here, we work very closely with many of our um, valuable partner stakeholders that are serving MCOs or state uh, Medicaid programs. Uh, Janice, I know you work very closely with several of them, and we we hear week after week the the concerns that are being raised there. Um, what types of things do you think uh, we can share? Yeah, um, you know the vendors are feeling left out, and when I say vendors, I'm talking about um, you know managed care organizations use a variety of vendors to conduct their business. Some are member facing, some are provider facing. Um, but regardless, they don't always get the information uh, from the managed care organization. So they're turning to Sellers Dorsey to kind of help them understand what is the impact going to be to them. Um, for one reason, it's kind of like what Jill said, they just want to be able to project what the business is going to look like going forward and understand what the impact is going to be to their enrollment. Um, these are often uh, uh, vendors that are paid on a PM, PM basis. Um, but they're also very concerned about continuity of care and wondering what can they do to help with this sort of all hands on deck approach. Because for example, let's say you use a vendor to do disease management or population health or uh, any kind of uh, clinical or case management services, they may be speaking with a member that just lost coverage for whatever reason. And um, they want to make sure that they're doing the right thing to help that person um, uh, to be able to continue to receive services. So there's a real concern about where do they refer people to um, and um, ensuring just like everyone else is trying to ensure that every effort has been made to keep them on, keep them eligible uh, as much as possible. So this is is one of those weird times where we all have the same desire. You know, everyone is on board, everybody is working toward the same goal. So in, in that sense, it's it's been great to see. I just think the vendors feel like they're so downstream, they don't always get the, um, the information. And week after week, as we meet with our clients, we um, encourage them to work with all of the MCOs in terms of understanding how they are supporting their state's activities here. So um, good idea to touch base with, with all of your vendors. And um, I'm just going to be transparent here and say guilty is charged. Um, I have uh, assumed the communication style of texting more than calling these days. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm perplexed by the confusion around whether or not we can or can't text related to uh, the PHE activities and the unwinding. Um, it seems to be a very confusing right now. And I don't know if there's um, an update on the latest guidance um, since we all last met. Um, I mean, I would just throw that out there to the panel if somebody wants to jump in there. What, what are we hearing in terms of the use of text messaging uh, with members? Lisa, did you wanna take that one or do you want me to take it? Um, I think you touched on it in some of your slides, Janice. So if you yeah. wanna, if you want to go ahead and then I yeah I, I was just gonna say I don't think we can assume a even consistent approach it's going to be very much state by state and MCO by MCO it is not as universally available as maybe people think it is I, I know some MCOs where it may be that the clinical team texts with members one-on-one 
Uh, some MCOs do that, plus they have um, the ability to do high volume texting. Um, so it, I, I think my message simply was, um, I also, it was guilty as charged Karen and would have thought that there would be um, more of an even utilization of text. And I just, I don't think we can assume that. So Lisa, I don't know if you have anything else to add. The, the only thing that I would add to it is, um, you know, we understand that states have the ability to text individuals without actually getting consent from them up front. Um, but many states have not, um, you know, identified the additional IT resources needed to be able to, to put those practices in place. And so um, what we do understand is in many instances, as Janice indicated, uh, MCOs do have the ability to text members because they've gotten, they've gotten that um, consent up front because they're using it for purposes of care management and other outreach activities that they've been doing with those members for a very long time. So to the extent that they've gotten consent, the MCO has gotten consent for texting. I think it's, a, it's definitely a, a way to get to the members. Um, if your state has reached out to you as an MCO to assist them with getting the word out to members, getting information back from members through that, that mode of communication, um, I think it's, it's a great way of, of gathering information and supporting the whole process, to be honest with you. So um, that's all I would offer is that states are probably not as far along in the, the sophistication of the IT structure to be able to text message, but plans likely likely might be. Great, thank you so much. We have several questions um, in the chat that I'm going to walk through now or attempt to hit all of them. We've got a little bit of time left, Patrick. I know you'll keep us on track here. Um, the first one uh, that we received is the extract two months and I'm not sure, I, th I think what we're saying extra here is extra two months. The extra two months, months. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, with the unwinding, uh, really just to allow states to start in August with the target date of an October renewal and then go through the next 11 months. So there's several questions here about what are the additional two months and what do we think that really means, Lisa? Yeah, I, I, it really is giving states the flexibility to either start um, a little earlier to initiate the process before they actually take action. So as, as I think the questioner indicated, there's a period of time where the individuals are given information, given notice of the, um, of the request for redetermination. And then um, once that information is submitted back to the state within the 30 day time period of the request, states then take action on that and have to give notification to the member before actually terminating to allow the member to refute those, those um, uh, information that the state has, has gathered to make that decision. So it really is up to the state to decide how they use that extra two months. Will it be at the beginning for the initiation process or will it be after to extend through the, the full 14 months towards the end? Um, and, and really that will be a state by state decision because as I indicated, um, states will decide whether or not they want to maintain coverage for individuals if they have the resources in place to be able to start the process before, um, before the end of the, the time frame, then they may do that. But it really will be a state by state decision um, allowing them to do that. Thank you. Um, there's some questions regarding the states that we cited in several different categories. This question is, is there a list of the 27 states available um, that we refer to? I, what we are going to do after the presentation is we will put together the list of the states that we referenced. However, recognizing it is a point in time, um, it's changing from day to day. So we will be able to provide some of that information for you. Uh, the next question was related to the increase in CHIP and Medicaid enrollment up 15 million. Is there a data source where uh, that, that reflects where these people reside or any kind of age or demographic breakdown? Um, what, I would, what I would reference is the CMS website. Um, they have issued their updated data reports and the most recent that they've um, indicated is from November. 
um, that identifies the additional populations. And I believe it does include a breakdown of um, the, the, the states where those individuals reside as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question I think was asked and answered regarding clarifying what is a population-based versus a time-based approach. I think we got an example of both with Illinois and Texas. Um, population-based obviously is the specific population cohorts and then the timing is over the time period. Um, the additional uh, two months was another question. Um, when is the state's report and plan, game plan due to CMS? Lisa, I think you touched on that in your comments. Yeah, the, the initial baseline report is due 45 days from the end date of the public health emergency. So for instance, in, a, in the example, if July 15th is the end of the public health emergency, it would be 45 days from the end of July that the plan would be due to CMS as the baseline. And then um, from there, the other report gets submitted uh, on a one-time basis and then monthly thereafter on the eighth of the month um, following the end of the PHE. Great, thank you. Will there be any information from the unwinding reports that can be made public? That will be up to CMS. Uh, you know, I, I believe that there will be a lot of interest in what states are planning to do and whether or not CMS um, releases the re those reports publicly or the state actually places those reports on their websites so that folks have a general understanding of what their processes are. But I would, I would say that folks should pay attention to both state and federal websites, as well as you know, potentially medical assistance advisory committee meetings where the state presents their approach um, to, to uh, that committee, et cetera. And then there's always asking your state regulator whether or not they intend to, to publish the report uh, in your state. Uh, the next question, uh, Jill, Janice, um, will CMS allow MCOs to use address change information received from the PCP uh, to update our contact information? Uh, we've had a lot of discussion around this. I think that's, I, I don't know about CMS. I think um, what I've been pondering is will states um, allow MCOs uh, to provide that updated information and will it be sort of one time only just for the unwinding of the PHE? Because, you know, as again, this happened before COVID, we would obtain the information um, and it would get overwritten by the next enrollment file. So I have no reason to think that that's going to change, but that perhaps on an emergency basis, they will use some of this information to try to reach people that they haven't been able to reach. I don't know, I Jill, if you have any thoughts. I would encourage anyone on the, on the call to reach out to your regulators and inquire as to whether or not you can assist them with that. Jill, did you have some other thoughts? I was just gonna say, I, th I think that the intent is there to allow that, but like Janice said, sometimes it's a systems issue um, that needs to be worked out. Um, we actually have one of our Medicaid advisory committee meetings coming up soon where we're hoping that we're going to get a lot of these answers around the technical pieces of it um, here in Illinois. So we'll see what they say. Fingers crossed we'll yeah. be able to support that. Lisa, you need to pull your crystal ball out. Um, this next question is for you. Um, any probability that the PHE will be extended past 715? Do you want to pontificate on that? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not as good as Punxsutawney Phil. Sorry. <laughs> probably a good poll. That would have been a good poll question. To see what the, what everyone else thinks. Even though I'm in Pennsylvania, and and he's our lucky groundhog, I guess it tells us what's happening. I I I I think uh, it remains to be seen. There's a lot of chatter about whether or not it will end prior to the fall elections, or will it end at the end of the year, or you know, has there been a signal because of the CMS guidance coming out to states that it's likely to end sooner? I mean, it, it's just all over the place. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think we have a definitive to share. I didn't think so, but I knew you, you often referenced your <laughs> crystal ball. So uh, let's see, here's a really good question. Would the crosswalk with the QHPs include providing information on all of the plans available in the state or just the MCO's affiliated QHP? Uh, I thought that was a really good question. I think I know the answer. 
Go ahead, Karen. Well, I would speculate that they would require you to promote any and all QHPs that are available. Uh, that's typically how um, it works with many of the ma um, Medicaid programs. But I don't know, Jill or Janice, if you have any additional feedback um, on that. I would say to the extent that a plan offers um, uh, an Affordable Act plan, they are allowed to um, let their members know about that. And I have heard that many plans are already doing that. I think we just got the hook though, and that we're out of time. So oh. I think we'll have to wrap up. Yeah, sorry guys, wonderful okay. webinar. I wanna thank the Sellers Dorsey team. Um, what an important topic. Could not be more timely. You guys did a great job. We really appreciate you bringing your expertise. As I said, they are MHPA's gold partner um, and have been super supportive of our organization and also our member uh, MCOs. So we want to thank you. Um, as a reminder, all registrants will be receiving the slides from Sellers Dorsey. You can follow up with them with any additional questions. And with that, I want to thank everyone for coming and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.